Hello everyone and welcome to Cram Surge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. And we'll talk about um, introduction to evidence-based practice. This is the second um, presentation on, on introduction to EBM. Can you see my screen? Yes. Lovely. Right, so um, what I'm going to do for this talk is talk about study designs again. We briefly mentioned study designs during the initial introduction for part one. So you can go back and have a look at that uh, YouTube uh, video if you're interested. And then I will mention the five steps of evidence-based medicine or evidence-based practice and um, explore just the first step today. So we'll tell you what the steps are and talk about the first step. Okay. So, like I said, we've talked about study designs before, and when we're talking about study designs, uh, we're limiting our discussion to clinical uh, study designs. So, if you remember, we talked about observational studies and experimental or interventional studies, and then we lumped a few other study designs under the uh, category of miscellaneous. So, under observational studies, um, you've got uh, studies that can be called case control studies, and then you've got your cohort studies and uh, cross-sectional studies. These are the three main types of observational studies that we need to know uh, about. And then there are these ecological and proportional mortality studies uh, that I've uh, added to the list just, for, just to mention. Uh, we don't come across many surgical uh, research that fall under this category. The next uh, group of studies are the experimental studies where there is an intervention that aims to uh, change the natural history of the disease process. They could be single arm studies. They could be two arms or more than two arm studies that are done uh, with at least one arm being the control uh, group. And if uh, in a control trial, you uh, introduce the uh, uh, the methodology of randomization, you get a randomized control trial. And another type of a control trial uh, or randomized control trial is a time series or a before and after trial. Again, in uh, surgical research, this is an uncommon uh, type of uh, intervention study. Finally, in the miscellaneous category, you've got validation studies, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, and economic analysis. So this is just a very uh, brief overview of the type of um, study designs that uh, will come across in surgical literature. Now, um, why do we have so many different study designs? Now, clearly these designs have different purposes. Um, so the purposes could be uh, that you explore a particular phenomenon or um, a, a particular group of patients uh, versus you, test, you test a hypothesis in, in a group of patients. So the uh, basic research purpose could be exploratory versus hypothesis testing. So you, you get different kinds of study designs for these different kinds of basic purposes. The other um, kind of stratification of purpose is primary research versus secondary research. Obviously, um, if you're doing a systematic review or meta-analysis, that would be secondary research. And there you acknowledge that there, there is already a number of papers on the topic and you want to collate the evidence and you want to submit the evidence and therefore you'll be doing what we call um, a secondary research and a systematic review would be a typical example of secondary research. Whereas if there is no prior data available, no prior studies, then you're doing an observational study or an interventional study, which would be primary research, right? So that's another reason for having different study designs. Also, different designs answer different types of research questions. And I'll explore this in a bit more detail when I come to uh, talking about research questions in a few minutes. Finally, um, there is differences in feasibility. 
For example, if you take a randomized controlled trial versus a um, cohort study, a cohort study is much more easier to do and there is uh, uh, less ethical issues involved compared to a randomized controlled trial and, and, uh, and less money involved as well compared to a randomized controlled trial. Again, if you compare a cohort study with the case control study, a case control study is much more easier and quicker to do compared to a cohort study. So there are these differences in feasibility and, and then therefore the need to uh, do um, a particular uh, design or prefer a particular design over, over the others. Okay, so these are some of the reasons why you've got so many different study designs. And we, we've got to recognize that each design has its own unique set of advantages disadvantages and its own place in the so-called hierarchy of evidence. Now, a number of you would have come across this particular pyramid or the so-called hierarchy of evidence, where at the top of the hierarchy, you've got your meta-analysis and systematic reviews upon which you base your clinical practice guidelines. And going down the hierarchy, you have the randomized controlled trials, the cohort studies, case control studies, case series, and so on. So essentially, uh, it is considered that the higher you are in this pyramid, the higher is the quality of evidence you get from these studies, okay? This is not necessarily true, and that's why some people don't like the phrase hierarchy um, when it comes to um, mapping these studies uh, or in this uh, kind of pyramid. And the reason for that is you can do a really well-conducted cohort study that actually gives you better quality evidence compared to a poorly conducted randomized controlled trial. So although RCTs in general uh, sit uh, at a higher level in the hierarchy of evidence, um, at the end of the day, it's not just um, the fact that it is a randomized controlled trial, the design has to be in a such a way that uh, the trial is valid, um, both from an internal validity perspective as well as from a perspective of generalizability or external validity. So in addition to its place in the hierarchy, a number of other factors will determine the quality. And therefore, we shouldn't uh, just completely rely on the fact that a study is an RCT and, and then assume that it has to be better than a cohort study when it comes to addressing a specific question. So, um, so for every study design, you can have a quality rating. And there are many ways in which quality has been assessed and studies have been categorized into different uh, levels of quality. But uh, an approach that is used by many people um, recently is this classification into um, one of these four different quality ratings, high quality, moderate quality, low quality and very low quality. Okay, so um, there's a lot in the literature about how quality of um, studies have to be assessed, how quality of evidence or certainty of evidence have to be assessed. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into the details of this um, in this talk, but I'll refer you to a website called gradeworkinggroup.org. And this is an internationally recognized working group that sets out a system and they call it the GRADE system. And that stands for Grading of Recommendations Assessment, Development and Evaluation System. And this is a system that is being proposed as a way to rate the quality of evidence of a group of studies in a review, for example. And then um, how to grade um, the strength of recommendations that are derived from um, putting together the evidence from all of these studies, right? So this system has been developed primarily for use by people involved in doing systematic reviews and people involved in writing clinical practice guidelines. However, there's a lot of data on, uh, there's a lot of information, I should say, and detail uh, on their website as to how to assess uh, the quality of evidence from published studies that you might find useful. Okay, now um, just a couple of uh, additional points, um, primarily from the grade group that I thought would be worth highlighting, is that like I said before, uh, the grade group 
um, recommends that you categorize quality into these four groups, high quality, moderate quality, low quality, and very low quality. Essentially, that would be based on how confident you can be that the effect that you're uh, reporting your systematic review or you're quoting from the study is uh, close to the true effect uh, in the population. Okay, so if you're very confident, then you call it high quality, moderately confident, moderate quality, and so on and so forth. And what GRADE proposes is that if you have a study design, say an RCT, uh, by definition, you should be allocating um, the RCT to a high quality of evidence and compared to an observational study, which would automatically be allocated to a low quality of evidence. Right. But then you don't stop there. You then look at a number of different factors. And these factors are listed in these two cells, which can either increase um, your, uh, your quality. For example, if you have an observational study, which you've categorized to low quality, then if the effect is very large, for example, in the observation study, and if there's evidence of dose response gradient, and all possible confounding factors have been accounted for, then you can increase the quality rating of the observational studies to high. And the same, uh, on the same basis, if you have a randomized control trial, but there is a significant risk of bias, or if the estimate is not very precise, or if you're suspecting publication bias in that negative uh, results have not been published, then you can, sorry, then you can lower the quality that you will um, assign uh, for the RCT um, uh, based on these factors. So in, in addition to saying that randomized control trials um, should be allocated a higher priority, they emphasize that you have to look into a number of other factors into how the study has been done and how the results have been reported, and then you can change the um, uh, end quality assessment if you like. Okay, let's now move on to the five steps of evidence-based medicine. You may already have heard of these steps, um, but I'll just repeat them for completion's sake. You've got the first step where you ask the right question. You've got the second step, acquire, where you go about acquiring the evidence um, from the studies that uh, have been done on this particular topic, on your problem, and to then move on to the third step where you appraise the evidence, you interpret the data, and then you apply the results of uh, the evidence that you've collected to your own clinical problem or to your uh, clinical question. And essentially, these four steps are the steps in, in practicing evidence-based medicine to be able to help you make decisions in the care of the individual patient or the patient in front of you. And then you evaluate the process. You, you um, reassess and see how you're able to incorporate and the evidence basis in your clinical practice. Um, and, and that's the final evaluation process. Okay, so this is a um, process that we acquire through practice. Um, it's not uh, of much value just to read about evidence-based medicine and forget about it. If we um, get into the habit of uh, generating uh, questions from the problems we encounter and go through the process of acquiring the evidence to answer the questions, appraising the evidence, applying it to the care of our individual patients and reflect upon the process, then you say that you, you know, you're practicing evidence-based medicine. Okay, so what we're gonna do for the next few minutes is simply talk about the first step, asking the question. And then let's do that with an example. So for surgical listeners, um, this wouldn't be an unfamiliar example. Let's say you've got somebody with right eye force of pain and tenderness. Let's say you've got a 30 year old male, you've assessed the patient in, in A&E or, or in the surgical assessment center. And you think, right, this is probably acute appendicitis. And let's say you get some investigations done and lo and behold, the white cell count is normal. The CRP is normal. You have got asked for a scan, uh, an ultrasound or a CT scan. Let's say that's normal as well. You're probably then thinking, right, what do I do next? This is uh, somebody I thought had appendicitis, but all of the tests, the inflammatory markers that I've requested are negative, the scans are negative. So you're probably be, uh, going to be asking yourself a number of questions. 
Um, it could be that does this patient actually have appendicitis? Uh, or in other words, what's the probability that this patient still has appendicitis given a normal white cell count CRP and CT scan? You could then say, well, even if he has appendicitis, does it really matter? Could he have any other alternative pathology that could be significant? Could you discharge the patient? Could you reassure and discharge with just some advice to come back if there's a problem? What's the um, safety uh, of that approach? The efficacy of that approach? What's the likelihood that the patient is going to come back with the perforated appendicitis? And that wouldn't be a very nice scenario, would it? Um, and you're probably also thinking, young patient, male patient, should we just do an appendicectomy or at least put a laparoscope in just to be sure and get, get the problem sorted? So these are all the kinds of questions that you might have when you deal with this problem. Now, these are all uh, what um, we um, call foreground questions. So as opposed to background questions, which don't necessarily relate to the problem at hand, which could be things like what causes appendicitis or what's the relationship between say acute appendicitis and ulcerative colitis, for example, or, or what are the molecular me mechanisms in the development of appendicitis? So those kinds of questions would be background questions, which we don't often concern uh, ourselves about in the management of um, uh, our patients. So just focusing on the foreground questions, there are all these questions that come to your mind, and these are in some ways not necessarily structured or not necessarily very clear. So you can't jump from this stage to looking at the evidence. So the thing to do is to start to construct a question that is focused and also at the same time clinically relevant. You want to ask a question that is going to help you uh, move forward the management of your patient. So for example, you might be thinking, I need to talk to the patient. So um, I need to be able to explain to the patient the likelihood of appendicitis. So I would really like to know what the likelihood of ap acute appendicitis or other significant pathology is in such patients. Another focused and relevant question would be, what is the effectiveness of laparoscopy in such patients over continued monitoring? Because that would be the um, fallback option. A third focused question could be, if I've decided to uh, monitor, which is better? Should I may keep the patient in hospital for 24 hours or 12 hours? Or uh, am I safe in discharging the patient, send them home, um, you know, don't waste a bed, that kind of thing in this group of patients. The key here is in such patients. So we've got to be um, clear about what kind of patients we're talking about. What is the cohort we're interested in? And that needs to be clearly defined. And here the, the, the cohort will be patients with clinically um, suspected appendicitis, but normal inflammatory markers and normal cross-sectional imaging. So that would be our cohort. The other thing to think about is when you ask a question um, saying which is better, which treatment is better, A or B, say monitoring in hospital or early discharge, assuming you're not going to operate, you've got to think about better for whom. Are we talking about um, better in terms of the patient or better for the hospital provider? Uh, hopefully not better for you as a surgeon. Also better in what way? Um, for the patient, is it pain? Is it quality of life? Is it readmission with um, severe pain? And, and, and also think about how much better by how, what degree? Uh, how much of an improvement are you hoping to, uh, to, 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 to see between the two uh, treatment options? So those are things to think about. So firstly, you've got to construct, uh, construct um, or think about a focus question and the question that is obviously clinically relevant. There's no point asking questions that uh, is not relevant to your management. The next is you have to improve the clarity of questions and also add detail where necessary to be able to go about and acquire the evidence to answer the question. So, this is where you probably all heard of the PICO format, the PICO format comes in handy. So just for completion's sake, I'll expand on the PICO. The P in PICO stands for population, which is the patient group or cohort that is of interest to you. The second is 
the um, is uh, I is for intervention, which refers to the intervention or the exposure that is uh, being considered. C is comparator or the control or standard treatment. And O is the outcome of interest or the key outcome of interest. Now, the PICO format is perfect for questions on therapy and harm, as uh, for example, which treatment is better or is this particular treatment uh, of increased risk? But it's also quite useful for a number of questions on risk and prognosis and on qu questions relating to diagnosis as well. So going back to the three questions we had formulated, uh, let's just take one of those questions, the last question, which was which treatment is better, monitoring in hospital or early discharge in such patients? So here you've assumed that you're not going to operate, you're going to keep an eye. And the question is, in such situations, is early discharge with appropriate advice uh, better or at least good enough, as good as monitoring in hospital? The obvious advantage being that uh, you don't occupy a bed. So in this particular uh, research question, the population obviously will be patients with clinically suspected appendicitis in the absence of raised inflammatory markers and a normal CT scan. So that's a very clearly defined patient group. And that's what you need. The intervention would be early discharge with details on how you're going to discharge, what advice you'd, advice you'd give, and when would you follow up, and so on and so forth. And the C, the comparator would be monitoring in hospital. And O, the outcome uh, could be, for example, unplanned readmission to hospital within 30 days. But this is just an example. You could have uh, a couple of key outcomes and a number of secondary outcomes that you might want to compare in the intervention arm um, to the comparator arm. And, and then you can make your mind up as to whether um, uh, early discharge is good enough or better than monitoring. Okay. Right. So the, the other uh, couple of things to think about when you uh, structure a question in the PICO format is that sometimes you don't necessarily have the intervention and comparative groups as separate groups. You might just have one group. And this is particularly the case in uh, when you're trying to address research questions that are uh, aiming to determine the natural history of the disease or prognosis. Let's say, for example, you want to say, you want to answer the question, what is the risk of representation with perforated appendicitis in this cohort? In that kind of uh, setting, with that research question, all you need is a large group of patients where you manage conservatively uh, and followed them over a period of time to determine the risk of uh, representation with perforation. So in that kind of cohort, you just have one group, you don't have separate intervention and control groups. Um, the other slight modification of the PICO uh, format proposed by some people is the addition of T, P-I-C-O-T, where T might, might either stand for time, uh, where, it, uh, where it then means time of outcome. So if in our example, we said 30-day unplanned readmission is the outcome, 30 days is the time. So you're being very specific about uh, the 30 days. I mean, it could be three months, it could be six months, but there are reasons why you've chosen 30 days. And deciding on that um, uh, early on when you're trying to address a question is also quite important. Some other people would suggest that when you say T, when you think of the PCOT framework, consider the type of study that you're going to be interested in, the type of study that will help you answer your question. Now, ideally, for most research questions, you have a question in mind uh, and you're going to look for studies, uh, you would be looking for a systematic review and a meta-analysis. And if that's been performed, that obviously uh, takes uh, all of the primary research studies that have been published on that topic into consideration, and that will give you a summation or a, sum, uh, a summary of the uh, key outcomes in, in the groups you're interested in. However, a systematic review is not always available. Sometimes it may not be relevant for the specifics of the PICO that you're interested in, or it might be a systematic review that is 10, 15 years out of date and things have moved on and you don't have a more recent review. 
So a systematic review and meta-analysis would be the type of study you'd probably go for to answer any um, clinical question, but they're often not available. So if you exclude systematic reviews, which are secondary research, then the ideal type of primary research that you're interested in to answer your question really depends on the type of question or on the category of question. So here's a little table to explain this further. So most clinical research questions, as um, I've explained before in a previous talk, can be classified into um, one of these categories. So they could be a question on therapy, um, yeah, or, or prevention. There could be a question on risk of prognosis. There could be questions on diagnosis. And I've uh, highlighted this in two separate rows. I'll come back to this in a minute. Or there could be a question on costs. You might say, I'm interested in discharging patients home early because we, we, are, we don't have the funds and, and resources and we are interested in minimizing resources. So it could be a question on costs. Now, based on the category to which your research question fits in, the type of primary research that you might be interested in might vary. So if you're interested in a therapy question, you're looking for RCTs. Ideally, if you don't have RCTs, then you look at controlled non-randomized trials. And if you don't have that, then you look at observational studies. If, however, you're looking at a question that falls into the risk or prognosis category, then it's usually a cohort study. And if you don't have a cohort study, you're looking at case control or a case series. Now, these are all obviously observational studies. When it comes to diagnosis, there's a little catch. Now, if you're looking at, say, diagnosing appendicitis with a, um, with a new um, imaging technology, let's say um, a five Tesla MRI or something, if the question is, is that new test a good diagnostic test in that what does it improve the accuracy of the diagnosis of appendicitis? And the kind of study you're interested in is probably a cross-section study with a gold standard that, uh, that will establish a diagnosis of appendicitis. I mean, that itself can become a bit controversial, but, but that's what you're looking for. However, if you're looking at a diagnostic study that is going to improve health outcomes in some particular way, uh, let's say reduce the risk of, uh, or reduce hospital stay, um, uh, for example, then you consider the diagnostic test along with any intervention that follows the test as a therapy, and therefore look for studies just like you would look for studies on therapy. So if you're looking at a diagnostic test with a particular health outcome in mind, then you look for uh, the study of primary research, just like you would look for a therapy study, which would be randomized controlled trials. If, on the other hand, you're looking at the diagnostic test with just the accuracy of the diagnosis in mind, then the type of study you're looking for is a cross-sectional study. Okay. And then finally, for questions on costs, you're going to be looking for economic anal um, uh, analysis, studies that have done economic analysis in detail. So effectively, uh, we have talked about formulating a clear and focused, answerable, relevant clinical question and formulating that question in the PICO or the PCOT format and looking for studies, primary research, we're talking about primary research here, that is based on the type of question whether it's a question relating to therapy or to risk or to prognosis, diagnosis or cost. Okay, so that comes to the end of this um, short um, talk. So to summarize, we've talked about study designs very briefly and their role in evidence-based medicine. We talk about the importance of asking the right um, clinical question. And asking the right question is the first step in the practice of evidence-based medicine. So before you go on to acquire your evidence by searching through databases, you could ask the correct question so you know what type of studies to look for. I briefly mentioned background questions, but we've been talking about foreground questions, which are questions relating to the clinical problem at hand.
We talk about the PICO format or the PCOT format with a T. And uh, we talked about the link between the type of question or the category of question and the primary study design. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.